Today we have two speakers for you, so you're doubly lucky. Our first speaker is Associate Professor Jess Nithian Anantharaja, who was recruited back to the Flory, uh, her hometown is Melbourne, um, from the University of Edinburgh. She was recruited back um, to, as part of this mechanism of stopping the brain drain from Australia. She's an Australia Research Council Future Fellow, and she now heads an independent laboratory called the Synapse Biology and Co Cognition Lab. So Jess's research interests really lie in uncovering the role of synaptic genes. So these are genes coding for proteins that live at the synapse, the gap between uh, two brain cells, and looking at those genes in cognition and disease. Um, not only uh, autism spectrum disorder, which is what you'll be hearing about today, but other neurodevelopmental disorders like schizophrenia, for example. Um, Jess's work is really groundbreaking, and she's actually provided the first evidence that different cognitive domains uh, that you'll hear about today are individually controlled by different families of receptors in that synapse. Uh, and this uh, provides novel insights into how um, human cognition evolved over the millennia. Uh, so she's also been working while she was in the UK on um, this touchscreen technology. So these are little iPads, and I believe you'll see some movies today, um, which the mice and ro uh, rats perform cognitive tasks on these iPad-like devices. And using that uh, test, it's directly translatable to human psychological testing that gets done in the clinic. Our second speaker today is Dr. Emma Burrows. Emma is a National Health and Medical Research Council Dementia Research Fellow, and uh, she's a number of dementia research fellows that we have at the Institute. You might recognise her when she gets up if you've seen the latest annual report. She's highlighted in a lovely story on page four there. So if you haven't seen it yet, make sure you uh, go onto the website and download the annual report from there. Emma leads a research program aiming to understand the neurobiology underlying cognitive disorders, again, including autism spectrum disorder. She's using novel technologies, again, these touchscreen technologies, where she also was in the UK for a period of time on a Victoria Fellowship learning how to best use these touchscreens in a lab setting to directly translate from human research. And as well as ASD, she also looks at attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, um, and particularly dementia. She has an interest in hence her fellowship. Her team uses a combination of uh, experimental manipulations and non-invasive brain imaging, so MRI on rodents, which is very exciting. Um, and you cou couples this with sophisticated behavioural analysis, which I believe you'll also hear about today. So this gives Emma a very powerful approach to understand um, the mechanisms of cognitive impairment. So without further ado, I'll get off the stage and I would like to invite Associate Professor Jess Nithinantharaja up to give to you your lecture today. Um, I'm very delighted and very honoured to have the chance to tell you a little bit about what we do here. Um, so no doubt I think we have a wide audience here today, um, and we've come here potentially for a variety of different reasons, but I think I can say that collectively we share the same interests and passion for trying to really understand and advance how we tackle brain disorders like autism. So let me start by saying that Emma and I are both not clinically trained. Um, we are basic, fundamental, behavioural neuroscientists who are really interested in understanding how the brain ultimately regulates our behaviour. And that's important because it's these behaviours that are altered in a variety of different brain disorders such as autism. But one of the great things um, about being based at an institute like the Flory um, and as Tom alluded to, I spent six years away in the UK, I had a fabulous time being based within the UK and being able to travel throughout Europe. But Melbourne is a phenomenal hub for brain research. And the Flory in particular, I think is wonderful because it genuinely values medical research at multiple levels. And what I mean by that is not only does it support discovering neuroscience, which is the work that Emma and I are leading, but it also supports the pipeline all the way up to translational impact, which is ultimately all our goals. But it's only by supporting research at all those levels can we really advance the strategies that we now can employ to 
en um, enhance the way that we manage uh, and support and really treat mental brain um, uh, mental disorders. So um, I'm going to start off by saying there's a, there's a lot of overlap. You'll see um, Emma and I have uh, a um, shared path, uh, shared histories, and so there's a lot of overlap you'll see um, in our talks today. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about the work that um, our uh, team is driving to give a bit of an overview of the background behind why and how we're asking the questions that we are. Um, and then I'll leave it to Emma to give you some detail into the way that she's approaching the um, similar or overlapping questions. So it's now known that up to one in 70 Australians are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And I think what's important to reflect is that the word spectrum, which was more recently, I guess, reclassified, really reflects the wide range and severity of symptoms or differences that people on the spectrum actually experience. And there's often a lot of comorbidity with other disorders. And what do I mean by that? Someone can be potentially diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, but also with things like epilepsy and intellectual disability. So there's a lot of complexity and overlap across these disorders, and that's important to keep in mind. And more fundamentally, I think we all appreciate this, but I, I can't say it enough, which is no two people on this spectrum are alike. And that we all have, just like all of us, there are unique strengths, interests, and also challenges that these individuals face. But from a diagnostic point of view, I guess we need to simplify some of that. So the common symptoms usually are difficulties with communication and social interactions, but also these obsessive interests or repetitive behaviours. But again, I'll reflect on that and I'll tell you a little bit more because we know that there's greater complexity in terms of the behaviours that are altered across these disorders. And that the quality of life for many children and adults significantly improves by not only diagnosis um, that leads to appropriate evidence-based support that recognises these individual needs. And so I highlight that because that's been a passion of mine in terms of really being able to articulate and model these individual differences across people and how do we try and tease that out a little bit more. So before I, we start to think about disorders, I want to take you all back to sort of thinking about how did we evolve these variety of behaviours that we now take for granted and do every day in our, in our life. And so these complex behaviours or these cognitive behaviours are ultimately, when you think about it, a toolkit of capabilities that really allow all organisms and us to regulate our behaviour to respond to changes in our environment. And that this toolkit has ultimately increased and become more sophisticated with evolution. And so some time ago, if you were to ask somebody, how is it that we evolved these variety of different complex behaviours that we use to navigate through our environment every day, people might have said, well, surely it's just because we have larger brains. But we all know this, which is, it's not just about size, is it? And the reality is, it's not. What we've come to really realise is that it really comes down to the molecules that make up the connections in our brain. So my previous mentor, Seth Grant, who's based in the UK, and his colleagues were some of the first to really shed some enormous insight into just how complex the machinery that regulate connections in our brain have evolved over time. And so if you have a look at this, this is just a quick schematic. This is a connection, and what we have is what's known as a, a presynaptic side and a postsynaptic side that come together. And work uh, over the last few years, we've predominantly worked on, even if you just look at one side of that connection, what we've come to really understand is that it's not made of one or two or three different molecules, it's made up of hundreds of molecules. And that the brain's remarkable computational power and capacity really stem from not only the fact that we have an enormous number of connections in our brain, but that at each one of these connections there's an enormous amount of plasticity that can occur. And that plasticity is because there are a variety of different molecules that come together to give 
greater computational power to be able to encode and register different forms of information from the environment. And what's really interesting, and I want to share with you this really fascinating fact, which I've, I still continue to find remarkable, is that if you look across the sort of the, uh, um, the sort of tree of life, I guess, if you go all the way back to around 4,000 million years ago, what we now know is that there is actual evidence for the core machinery that make up our connections in the brain. These core machinery is actually very ancestral, even before the birth of neurons, for example. So we know that even in these single cell organisms that were potentially out in ponds um, and in rivers, they were still responding to the environment. There were changes in temperature, for example, and changes in acidity. And we know that it was these signaling complexes made by these fundamental proteins that were there encoding and registering this information. And that what's happened with evolution and across time, and you can see these are the single-celled uh, um, organisms, to invertebrates such as flies and worms, that that machinery became a little bit more complex. And then there was this a molecular event that happened around 550 million years ago that really expanded that machinery between invertebrates and vertebrates, which now allow us and a variety of other in, uh, vertebrate animals to have these very sophisticated machineries ready to encode information from the environment and process that information in a more sophisticated way. So you can think about it like this. It's really about having the toolkit that potentially allows us to be able to regulate the kind of responses that we can have. So if you have a simple toolkit versus a more complex, we, we see this as a potential driver for what really allowed all vertebrates to have more complex behaviours and what I refer to as a cognitive repertoire. And this is interesting because one can think about it as while the expansion um, of this machinery became more sophisticated with time, it allowed us to have all these wonderful cognitive behaviours and complex behaviours, it's potentially variants and disturbances in that same machinery that ultimately then lead to a variety of brain disorders. And I know there's a lot on this slide, but the take home message here, this is a schematic, this is a review that was written a few years ago um, by Thomas Bergeron, bear with me. And all I wanted to articulate here, I just want you to focus on the various molecules that are highlighted in red. And the reason for this is, this is just a simple schematic. This is the, the what's in the green is, was part of the presynaptic. What's in the blue represented down here is the postsynaptic. And again, just to highlight that just at these connections, enormous number of molecules that have come together to be coordinated to allow information processing to occur. And the molecules that are highlighted in red are ones where we know that there are variants that have been identified in individuals with autism. Highlighting that when things go wrong at these connections, and there's a variety of ways that, that can go wrong, it potentially manifests in overlapping symptoms that lead to disorders. And so the work that we've been focusing on more recently, and Emma will um, expand on these, is how we can utilise these rare penetrant gene variants as a really powerful model to be able to understand underlying shared biological pathways that are really important for disorders like autism. And so here is an example. This is a major neurotransmitter receptor in the brain. And you can see it's not just about receptors. It's actually about a complex of proteins that come together to form a signalling machinery that allows to ensure that um, information that is received in the brain can then be transmitted appropriately. And so we've been working on this family of proteins called neuroligins, and Emma will also um, elaborate on uh, aspects of that uh, family protein member a little bit later on. And so as Tom introduced, Ultimately, what we're really interested in is how can we try and dissect and really understand complex behaviour in a way that allows us to really interrogate what's happening under, in, inside the brain. And this is where animal models really provide a powerful way to look at underlying biological processes. <laughs> 
And so when I moved to the UK um, in the late 2000s, there was a new technology that was being developed by a lab in Cambridge at that time that really tried to advance the way that we try and understand human behaviour. So in the clinic, for quite some time, people had been moving away from traditional sort of pen and paper tests um, to utilising more automated systems to look at different types of cognitive behaviour. Some time ago, this work had already been translated into primates and monkeys, and so it was not too long before that was then advanced and modelled in rats and mice. And so this was the initial prototype that we were working with. And in these touchscreen assays, or iPads, as um, Tom introduced, what we can do is it's, there's a chamber. And on one side of the chamber, you have these infrared touchscreens where we can automatically control the types of stimuli that we display. And when animals go up and they actually directly nose poke, they don't use their paws, or they can, they nose poke stimuli to then earn these little rewards. And we can use little sugar pellets, or we can use um, uh, strawberry milk, which we know that they also love. And the great thing, it's conserved, isn't it? Talk about conservation in things that we like. Um, and the great thing about these is that these were commercialised a few years ago, and Emma and I were at a meeting just last week whereby we heard that over 300 laboratories around the world are now utilising this technology. But what's fantastic is that the Flory um, has the largest capacity is actually leading the development of this uh, within Australia. And we can actually test multiple animals at the one time. So there's a variety of reasons why this method of testing is more comparable to what's done with humans um, and advantages. But the thing that, and um, parts of this Emma will also expand on, but the thing that I want to tell you a little bit about is the fact that for me, I think one of the most, one of the greatest advantages is that it really allows us to look at a battery of tests to develop a profile of an individual animal. And so just like what's available in the clinic, whereby you can look at a variety of different tests that maybe allow us to look at different types of memory um, or uh, being flexible and attention, we've generated a variety of different tests that we can also do in rats and mice. And so let me show you this. This is the kind of data that we get when we can systematically look at what happens when we take an animal and uh, um, standardise and cognitively assess them across a variety of different assays. And so this was some of the first work where we were looking at this family of genes, for example, and these had variants across, um, across these four different families. And what we found is that these were the various different tests that we did, and the details don't matter, but what I want you to appreciate is anything whereby it's um, in grey, it means that we didn't find any differences. Anything in red is an increased performance and anything that's in blue is decreased performance. And I think one of the advantages here is that not only can we detect bi-directional changes, but the other thing, which I think is very relevant to autism, is increased doesn't necessarily mean better and decreased doesn't necessarily mean worse. I think we need to move beyond this and realise that behaviour is adapted in differential ways. And so when we look at this, what we can see is that you can have a variant in a particular gene, and what it can do is it can actually potentially change behaviour in one direction, and you can have a, um, a variant in a, nut, in a family member of that gene, and it can regulate behaviour in another way. And what this really tells us, these are all variants or genes that are important for regulating connections in the brain, what this really tells us is that these individual genes and proteins that come together to make up synapses are important for fine-tuning that and that they specifically regulate different types of behaviours, which gives us greater insight because we know that there are mutations in these particular genes that have been found in autism. And you can see how one individual can potentially present with one profile and another individual another profile. And so one of the greatest things, obviously, about utilising technology is it gets us a little bit closer in terms of comparative testing to humans. And so not only do we have a variety of assays that we can use in mice, well, there are a variety of human touchscreen batteries that we can also use. And so here's some work that we did when we were um, still in the UK, 
We know that there are these mutations in this one uh, gene, for example, DLG2, that's been found in autism. Interestingly, it's found in schizophrenia, intellectual disability and bipolar. Again, this is not, in, this is not new for us in the sense that I think we need to um, deconstruct the way that we think about separate disorders and think about the symptoms that potentially underlie and are common across disorders. And what we did was we actually identified some individuals who had mutations in the same gene and we had a mouse model of that exact same gene. And here's what we found when we assayed the mice on a set of touchscreen tests and this is the behaviour that we saw. And when we gave these similar touchscreen tests to individuals with the mutation, what we found <laughs> was they showed a remarkably striking similar phenotype and that this phenotype was actually very specific. This is not the kind of thing that we see across all um, animal models. Suggesting that this could really be a translational tool to be able to really bridge the gap between animal and human studies. <coughs> Extending this, we then wanted to really ask questions, well, wouldn't it be really wonderful if we could use the same test in both animal models as well as individuals? And that's what we did. Here's a test that looked at um, visual spatial learning and whether you can learn where an object is in a given place. And here is again a mouse model with mutations or variants in this DLG2 gene and we see that these are control animals that learn across time. And when you um, have a variant in this gene, these, um, these animals were actually uh, impaired in being able to learn this. And when we did this exact same test in individuals with the same mutation, we saw a similar phenotype. Again just highlighting this idea of really advancing how we can translate these, um, these findings uh, from both species. So now I just want to tell you one is that we have a wonderful platform. We have a pipeline and a platform that allows us to really be able to dissect distinct behaviours that are relevant to disorders and then we want to interrogate that a little bit more in terms of understanding what's really happening in the brain. So I just want to give you just an overview of some of the approaches that we're doing. So I've just shown you how we have a platform that allows us to really comprehensively assess different types of behaviours, from things like motivation, for example, to different types of complex learning, um, to being flexible. And again, this is uh, some work that we've been doing more recently here, looking at this family of neuroligin, um, genes and what you can see here is that now that we've been able to identify that mutations in this gene for example differentially impact motivation we can then use those behaviors and those models to look more deeply in terms of what's really going on to regulate that behavior in those opposing ways. One way that we're doing that is really using these advanced microscopy tools. <laughs> And so one of the great things in neuroscience over the last few years has really been an explosion in the tools that have really come online to really advance how we understand the brain. So here is a section taken through the mouse brain. This region here, um, if anyone's uh, become used to looking at these mouse brains, this is the hippocampus. Many of you know this is um, still regarded as highly as a centre for how we encode memories. And so what we can do now is rapidly acquire, so this image is actually composed of 32,000 individual images that have been combined. And at each one of those images, this is what it looks like. And where you see a little green dot or a little red dot is actually a connection. And so what we can do is gain high resolution microscopy techniques to be able to image across whole mouse brain sections and what we can do is we can actually do that across several sections to get an, an, an idea of what um, the synaptic balance looks like across the brain. What I mean by that is we can use markers that look at excitatory inhibitory, different types of synapses to try and understand when you have variants in a particular gene or at different stages of learning, how does the brain adapt? How does it change in terms of its connectivity to represent um, those changes. Similar to that, what we can now do is these wonderful technology that's come about, whereby we can actually place these little tiny miniature microscopes on top of mice, mouse heads. Um, and we can actually watch them. We can watch them while they're freely behaving um, and performing tests to really look at activity of neurons. And so here's an example of what you might get. 
This is some of the raw images, and we've got wonderful packages that allow us to be able to really decode each one of these individual neurons. And then you can colour code those to try and understand uh, and, and track individual neurons across time. And that's giving us great live insight into the types of neuronal activity that underlie different behaviours and how that's altered uh, and changed across time. And then lastly, uh, one of the other things that's really come online in the last 10 years is this technique of optogenetics, whereby you can actually use light to activate or inhibit certain populations of cells in the brain. And so we've been using this more recently, and we know, for example, that if we activate certain parts of the prefrontal cortex, we can actually stop some repetitive behaviours. So it's allowing us to really gain insights into how we can dissect the circuits in the brain and the connections in the brain that underlie certain behaviours and potentially regulate those. And lastly, what I want to say is that I've had a real passion in terms of how we advance um, uh, modelling of cognitive behaviour, both in basic science but also in the clinic. And so what I find really interesting is that if you look across various clinics around the world or around, um, uh, around Australia, you'll see that different clinicians like to use different tests for how they will uh, employ for, for diagnosis and or looking at cognitive behaviours. And so when I approached members at the um, Murdoch Children's Research Institute, I realised that, for example, one of the things that's predominantly used is this test called the BRIEF2, which looks at these executive processes in terms of things like repetitive behaviours and attention. And so we've been uh, discussing, and one of the things that I wanted to put forward was, why don't we systematically look at different batteries that allows us to test the same behaviours and see which one's potentially more sensitive, which one is going to allow us to maybe advance the way that we approach diagnoses um, and allow us to do that in a more systematic way across laboratories and or clinics. And so we're embarking on this study whereby we're actually going to be taking one uh, traditional, I should say, um, pen and paper test, which is a brief two, and comparing it to two of these um, touchscreen-based automated assays to more unbiasedly look at and see which ones, again, give us sensitivity in being able to detect uh, the features that we really uh, think are really important. Okay. And on that note, I'll hand it over to, to Emma. Um, it's such an honour to follow you. Um, your talk, Jess. Uh, Jess and I worked together a long time ago, and I remember you trained me on a technique to look at synapses. Um, and I was very much a, a junior scientist, and um, you gave me some really good advice when I missed a very key ingredient. And we had a lot of laughs back then, and your work is very inspirational. And my work, as you said, is a small slice of the kind of approach that Jess's lab takes. Um, I wanted to start by first talking about, I guess, my motivation and why I started asking the question, what is autism? Um, my parents, uh, and they still do, dedicate their lives to working with people in the education sector. Um, sometimes they work with teachers, uh, most often they work with children. And their role and their passions are to ensure that everyone gets a, a, a chance, everyone integrates and everyone gets um, the time that they deserve so they can learn. And I was really very much indoctrinated, I guess, with that approach. And as a result of um, their work, I was allowed to go and work with them. And as a young adolescent, before I embarked on my university career, I was able to work with a number of children with autism and started to ask the question of, well, this is a really phenomenally different experience that this person that I'm working with is having. Ha is ha having sorry. And why is it that our brains are so different? So I thought I would talk just briefly about one boy who really inspired me to keep asking these questions. And he introduced me to this amazingly sinister creature. Uh, this is the New Jersey Devil. And at the time when I met uh, this young boy, he was 12, and he was about to um, take that big jump from primary school to high school. And for any child, that's a really difficult um, jump because you've got a brand new environment. Um, the, the school is, is different in the way that you move around. You don't have the same classroom. And my role was to help him integrate into his high school. 
And so we went to his new high school and we researched the New Jersey Devil. Uh, we we moulded the New Jersey Devil in art. Uh, we looked for books. This is pre-internet time, so we were very much looking um, in the old school style of encyclopedia. He convinced me that he just debunked the myth of the Loch Ness Monster, and it did not exist, but he was not convinced yet about the New Jersey Devil. And what really struck me is a, is a, a very different thing about the way that I was thinking, even as a 12-year-old, was that my sense of reality was, was very well defined. Yet this young child had a very broad and creative approach to the way that, that we did our science project on the New Jersey Devil. He also couldn't do any maths that equaled six. Um, and he also thought that anything starting with E was evil. And you may note that my name was Emma, and I am so glad that he overlooked my name because my time working with him gave me a really uh, phenomenal chance to see that his brain was different to mine, that he struggled, and that I had a serious privilege um, in my education because I didn't have the same struggles as he did. And because of my parents' influence, I think that really very much drove me to continue asking this question. And clearly, we're very interested in what underlies autism. Um, so this is a phenomenal, phenomenal um, set of images, not mine, unfortunately. I wish I could claim credit. Um, but this is a, a walk through the same memory region that Jess introduced before. But what is absolutely staggering is the complexity. So you can see the number of neurons that we're, we're encountering as we zoom through the brain. And you can see the connections they make. It is a dense forest. So if we are to understand how these connections are different in different brains, do we need to see the trees for the forest or do we need to see the forest for the trees? What's the kind of approach that is best attuned? So we do focus on the synapse, and this is the area where all of this communication between the connections is occurring. And as Jess beautifully introduced, we are interested in the machinery that makes this synapse a functional one. And synapses can be active, they can be silent, they can be overactive, or they could just be active every now and then. And it's actually the kinds of um, pieces of, of machinery that, that are present at this particular synapse that determines whether the synapse works in a particular way. So in particular, we are interested in the way that the brain might be connected differently in autism. And as Jess introduced, we believe, we believe that DNA plays a role. Um, so our genetic code is responsible for all the initial wiring of our brains. Um, but then our environment patterns, how those connections um, occur and which ones remain and which ones change. So I thought I might take you on a, a very small journey into one particular DNA change that I'm interested in in my group. So if we represent DNA like a string of letters, which is actually how we represent DNA, um, we have a <coughs> string of letters that actually leads to something that is meaningful. So DNA will encode a protein or a piece of machinery. And in this case, the string of letters, I have a cat. Different types of variations in our DNA can lead to very different types of effects. So a deletion in a bit of our DNA can lead to a piece, like a protein that is missing. So if we delete cat from I have a cat, that sentence no longer has meaning. And a lot of the um, mouse models that Jess presented before have a deletion like this. Something is completely missing. What happens if we take that something out of the brain? How does that brain wire and what occurs, what happens as a result of that change in wiring? Another form of variation in DNA is a translocation, which is when you change things around a bit and DNA gets swapped. And in this case, cat A, I have, it's a very difficult sentence to say because again, it's lost its meaning. The one I'm particularly interested in is one that's termed a missense variation. And this is one in which a, one, a single letter is actually changed. And this is a very, very minor change in DNA. But you can see that in a simple sentence like this, it can have a very, very different meaning. So I will introduce this particular mouse um, in a moment. But I just wanted to make the point that um, in some cases, our genetic variation can give us an advantage. Um, and this uh, individual here has a phenomenal skill of being able to fly over a city once in a helicopter and then draw a bird's eye um, view to scale 
and what a, what a remarkable skill. But that's not to say that his life is easy. He has this phenomenal skill, but he does struggle in even the most basic tasks. Um, so having an advantage come, sometimes can come at a cost. There are genetic variations in autism, and Jess introduced that amazingly, phenomenally overwhelming diagram with all of the red proteins. As scientists, we do get overwhelmed, um, and sometimes we want to reduce that complexity. So one way to do that is to look in families, and a very small percentage of cases in autism, do we see, we see the same DNA change throughout the whole entire family. And this approach has actually given us some clues as to where to focus our efforts. And this is an approach that um, we have particularly used. So back to the synapse, and you can see here that these two proteins, when you introduce that I have a rat mutation into the, the protein that is encoded in red here, they don't bind together anymore. And this is the specific mutation or the DNA variation that we're interested in, which is an R451C um, missense variation in neuroligin 3. So I don't need to, to remind you exactly where it is, but it's conveniently coded in red and it was right in the center of Jess's beautiful diagram. So what happens when we put the same DNA variation into a mouse? What kinds of DNA changes or what kinds of um, connection changes do we see? We are not the first to look at this particular mouse with the R451C variation, and a number of people have. And what a, a common find is, is it actually that their um, imbalance in the brain is actually, um, it's not the same as when you don't have this variation, which is a common thing that you also see in patients. So there are some differences in the way that the brain is firing. From a behavioural point of view, this is where my team came in. And we've been looking at the behaviour of this particular mouse for a number of years now, and we've found that when they're very young, they tend to chase mice, and they chase mice more often. So they're very persistent with their social interaction. When we track them as adults, this social interaction actually turns into aggression. So our mice with the DNA variation, our NL3 mice that we call them, um, in, if we're using the acronym, they, they tend to be very social, but they're not actually social in the same way that we would normally predict. This is an assay we developed, which actually came from the clinic. It's a really simple one, though. Um, this particular assay is how often and in what order does a mouse interact with an object? And we found that our mice actually interact in a sequence and they repeat this sequence over and over and over again, which was really striking to us. And we thought, wow, this is, this is very similar to what we see in the clinic. Another thing that we do is we're very interested in eavesdropping in on our mouse conversations. And I was completely shocked. I've actually had mice as pets since I was the age of six, so my family think it's phenomenally weird that I do the kind of work I do now, um, but I always suspected as a six-year-old that my mice were talking to me, but they do actually talk, and I'll see if the, um, this, I'll just make sure that I've, um, mutate, here we go. This is a secret language that mice use. I have pitch shifted it down 10 times. Sounds like bird song. And it's complex. What I didn't realise is that this is actually going on in a mouse community all the time. So mice are using this secret language in the ultrasound. So as I mentioned before, we've pitch shifted this recording 10 times um, down in order for us to be able to perceive it. So it's 10 times higher than what we can actually physically perceive. I also slowed this recording down, so this little tiny chirps happen at a rate of 10 to, 10 to the second, and what we found in our mouse is that our mice use less of those really beautiful convoluted long calls that you heard just at the end of that recording. And other groups have shown that it's actually that call that is attractive to other mice. So using these three assays, we've got a bit of a sense that this particular mouse has a different way of interacting socially with its cage mates, with its friends. It has a different way of interacting with objects, and it also has a different way of communicating. And we were really interested to ask some questions around, kind of true to my, I guess, initial questions when I was a 17-year-old, around the perception 
of these particular animals. Where do they shift their focus? Do they see the bunny or do they see the rabbit? So this is a really complex question to ask in a mouse. You might note that the assays are used to look at social behaviour and to look at object visitation. They're very, very simple tasks. Mice do this naturally in the environment. Do, do we have a way of looking at a complex behaviour like a shifting of attention in mice? And we do, and Jess has introduced this, introduced this wonderfully for us. So if we turn to the clinic, what do we know about the shifting of attention in autism? One thing that the clinicians agree on is that it's varied and that everyone has a slightly different way that they see the world. But a lot of studies are reporting while some people have an advantage in visual search tasks, others are find, find it very difficult to focus, in particular when the world is very unpredictable. So what is it that our animal models see? How do we actually get to this question? And in particular, my, um, my colleagues in the clinic find it very frustrating that they don't see the same thing in each group of people who have autism. So when we conduct these attention tasks in participants who come into the clinic, we don't see the same patterns of behaviour. Could it be that in a mouse we're able to see a bit more consistency? So this is the touchscreen task that we use to look at attention. And you'll note that our animals are not touching the screen. This one did, though. Our mice are only rewarded for one image out of five. And this is a really tricky task for, I think, a lot of people to do. They have to inhibit their behaviour. They're racing to the back of the chamber here to get their strawberry milkshake reward, and they're beautifully inhibiting their response to what we term a distractor image. This is a test that comes straight from the clinic and it's called the continuous performance test. And what it's getting at is the ability to, ability to pay attention to a lot of cues and to filter out the irrelevant ones and to only respond to the one that you need to respond to. And you can see how important this is in everyday life, in particular in the classroom, and in particular for that young child I worked with who found it very tricky to sit still and very tricky to pay attention to one task when the classroom was very loud and very busy. So we are very interested in, initially, do our animals get it correct? Can they filter the correct image that we want to reward them for over all of the other distractors. And the animal with the DNA change is in red. And you can see that it's hovering above the animals that don't have this DNA change the whole time we are training this animal. So each individual data point here is a separate day. We do train our animals every day, which is a really large undertaking. We have to feed them every day as well, just as you would your pet. So we're in here on the weekends looking after our animals, and I spoke to my daughter this morning about this, and she said, your mice are like little guide dogs, but they don't wear jackets, do they? But they definitely, they, they help you, don't they? They help people. And I said, yes, that's absolutely what they are. They're working mice, and our mice work very hard for their milkshake. And you can see here that the mice with the, the DNA change are actually at an advantage in this case. How do they go in inhibiting their response, though? Pretty well. If our animals are underneath our normal, or our, sorry, our animals without the mutation, this means they're actually inhibiting their response at a greater rate. And you can see from the very get-go, these animals were able to inhibit their response to the distractors at a, at a better rate. So hovering underneath the black line means that they're at an advantage again. We looked into their response time. Now, this is something that a lot of clinicians look at. How quick was someone at responding to an image? And the noise represents the distractor images that we don't want them to respond to. The signal represents those ones that lead to a milkshake reward. And you can see that the red is hovering above. So actually, they're not very fast at responding to the correct images. They're actually slower at responding to the correct images, which we thought was really interesting. These mice are actually very conservative and they're holding back their responses. They're slower to respond to their reward, but when they do, they get it right. So it's a very unique style of behaviour that is leading to this advantage. And you can see we've trained them here in this particular stage of the task for 18 days. This task went on for a number of months. Once we got to a point where we were really satisfied that our animals were plateauing and they were at a stable performance, 
Unfortunately, we added a little bit of um, unpredictability, and this is when the task gets really tricky. So instead of becoming something that they do every day, instead of becoming something that's habitual and part of their everyday morning routine, we changed the contingencies of, the, of this particular task. So we didn't bring up the stimuli at the set time. We changed the, the predictability of when the stimuli would appear. Sometimes it was a long wait, sometimes it was a short wait. We also changed the duration that the stimuli were on the screen from two seconds all the way down to 0.2 of a second. So it's just a brief flash. This really pushed all of our animals to perform at a higher standard. And what, how did our animals go in this case? We saw that our animals um, with the DNA change in red lost their advantage. So at the two second point, you can see that they're still hovering above. They've got the advantage at this point. But when we take the stimuli duration down to 0.2 of a second, they lose this advantage completely. And in some cases, when we look at their ability to, to be accurate, and this is a case of looking at how many hits they get, at the 0.2 second, they actually go below the animals that don't have the mutation. So this is something that we found consistently, no matter how we added the unpredictability into the task. While these animals were at an advantage, if they were overtrained and if they were um, trained at baseline levels, they were not when we added the unpredictability. So I, I like to go back to that image of um, the two scenarios walking down the road. It could be that if you walk down the road and there's not that much stimuli being thrown at you, there's no balloon, there's no car headlights, you see more of the world. But if you actually have a lot of stimuli being thrown at you, you might not perceive the same scene. My work has introduced me to some wonderful and very inspirational people, and I am so lucky uh, for that. And one of them is Catherine Johnston, um, Associate Professor, sorry, Catherine Johnston. And she works at the Psychological Sciences um, uh, Department here at Melbourne University, and she's leading a project um, she calls Spotlight Project. Her work is in um, not only adolescents and adults, but in children who have ADHD and a diagnosis of autism. <laughs> Um, and also people who don't have any diagnoses. So she's really interested in attention in particular, so our interests overlap. We really want to know what determines where you put that spotlight of your attention. One of the tasks that she's been looking at in over 200 children um, with another group down in Monash is one that really gets to a fundamental form of attention. Now, this is the kind of attention that um, would direct you towards your mobile phone if it was ringing. So just say you didn't put your phone on silent in this audience and your phone rang, you would quickly go towards it, but that particular um, form of attention is exogenous. You weren't expecting it to go off. So exogenous means outside, so that form of attention is outside of your actual um, intention. Another form is endogenous. If you're expecting your alarm to go off because you put a timer on to make sure that you kept a time, then you would be looking at your phone. That's endogenous because it's driven from internal um, processes. So Catherine's work is very much around getting to how do we understand what brain changes are underlying endogenous and exogenous attention. She's found that giving a tiny little alerting cue just before showing an endogenous task actually primes people to perform better. And she believes this could be a really important therapy for rolling out into schools. And this is a really inspirational, um, non-pharmacological uh, concept, and I can't wait to see what comes out of her project. Our conversations, though, turn back to my work. Can we bring her test into, the, into our mouse clinic? And we did. We tried, and we were successful. So let's break it down. What, what is the test? First, we get our mouse or our person to fixate at a particular point. And this is really tricky for a mouse because they're very, very hyperactive. They run around. They are far worse than my 18-month-old child. They do not sit still. We then ask them to respond to a target, either on the left or the right of that fixation point. So initially, one of our great wins was actually we've trained a mouse to stand still. So I'm not sure we we're going to get any Nobel Prizes for that, but we feel really good that we've been able to do that. Um, really critical for that mouse to stand still because we want them to see this tiny flicker of a cue. The cue is either exogenous, a flash to the left or the right, 
or it's endogenous, a set of lines that go left or right. Left will indicate to go this way, right indicate that way. So you can see here these cues predictively target or predict are predictive of the actual target. So we should expect that our mice, if given these cues, will be quicker at choosing this target. Of course, we throw in another spanner to, to confuse the animals. We give them an invalid cue, or invalid target, I'm sorry. So given these cues, these animals will actually go the other way and they'll be a bit rattled. Then they will have to change their behavior and go to the other side. So what do these tests look like? There's the exogenous version of the task. It's very quick. Our animals are able to perceive these cues and make the correct, uh, correct decision. And you saw then an inappropriate orientation of the animal. So this leads to a longer response time. In our endogenous task, our animals performed. My collaborator Catherine almost fell off her chair because her children cannot do this task. So we were really, really excited that Milkshake clearly is such a, an amazing reward that we can get our animals to do this task. So what do we see when we actually look at their response times? We see that we can get this classic clinical phenotype, that in people that do this task, this is exactly what we would see, that for those targets that invalidly cued, you see a longer response time. This is pretty, pretty standard. So what we want to do now is bring this, this task to our animals with the DNA mutation. This is actually happening right now as we speak. Um, this is exciting work because we've got this pipeline now and it happened just here in Melbourne. It's my vision that understanding the brain changes that make us different will enable us to change the way we perceive people and change the way that we actually design our environments. We as neurotypicals, and I speak particularly for myself, are we missing out because there is so much that is un, un, um, unharnessed wonder that comes from people who are not excluded, sorry, who are excluded from our society. And I very much learned this lesson early on, and I continue um, to use this as my inspiration for my work. In particular, I wanted to thank my wonderful team, Team Science. It's it's this is just one little tiny team. Um, teams can be big, teams can be small, and teams can include people from other departments. So this is just my little group who, here at the Flory. Very proud of the work they do, and they are uh, visionary. Wanted to also make a plug for if you wanted to be involved. So I showed you the mouse version of that task, but I've also been the guinea pig and I've sat through the human version. We are looking for people who are neurotypical and also who have a diagnosis of autism from ages eight all the way through to 40 years old. So if you're keen to be involved, email and um, come along and see what it's like to be put through an attention test. It's basically like playing a computer game. I enjoyed it. Towards the end, I got a bit tired, um, but it was really great to actually, for me personally, to have that insight into what it's like to be um, present, to be a participant in one of these tasks. Um, and it's also very exciting that we get to, to work with psychologists um, as, as a biologist. It's been very, very important for me to change even the language that I use. Um, thank you very much for, for your attention.